sheep and cattle to investigate the uptake of iodine-131, one of the dozens of radioactive isotopes created during an atomic explosion. Well, it was clear that one of the biologically important radionuclides was radioiodine. And the advantage of radioiodine is that it has a very clear exposure path and it's quite easy to measure. If it gets onto grass or pasture and it's uh, eaten by the sheep, some of it will pass straight through, but a lot of it will go to the thyroid gland and concentrate there. And of course the thyroid gland is, is in the throat and it's quite easy to excise the thyroid gland, take it out of the sheep and send it back to the laboratory for careful monitoring. Headling didn't tell the owners of the sheep and cattle the use to which they were going to be put. And that was going to be important for the British and Australian governments, that we kept this as quiet as possible. Information about radioactive fallout was considered classified by the nuclear powers. The first the public heard of the dangers came in 1954 when an American hydrogen bomb test in the South Pacific yielded three times more destructive power than expected. A vast radioactive cloud blew over the Marshall Islands. The inhabitants suffered severe burns and nausea. Fallout also engulfed a Japanese fishing trawler, the Lucky Dragon. The Japanese fishermen were exposed to relatively high doses of radiation and the radio operator died. Now, it was impossible to keep the lid on this story. And gradually, gradually, the, the realization that these atmospheric explosions contained hidden dangers. To alleviate growing public concern over fallout, Prime Minister Robert Menzies created an Atomic Weapons Test Safety Committee, manned by some of the nation's leading physicists and a meteorologist. Chief Defence Scientist Leslie Martin was named chairman, but the dominant force on the committee was brilliant British-born physicist Ernest Titterton. During the war, at the age of 29, he triggered the world's first atomic explosion in the Nevada desert. In the early 1950s, Hedley Marston's close friend, Mark Oliphant, invited Titterton to establish a school of physics at the new Australian National University in Canberra. Sir Ernest was very much a nuclear bombardier. He really did believe that nuclear weapons had a role to play in, in preventing a, another catastrophe like the Second World War. He also had quite a clear view in his own mind that radiation was not dangerous. So putting somebody like that in charge of the safety of the Australian public and, and controlling fallout was very much like a poacher becoming a gamekeeper. The safety committee's role was to ensure weather conditions were suitable for firing at all future tests. It would also independently monitor radioactive fallout at 34 locations across the country. The safety committee let Headley know that they were also measuring I-131 around the country as well as he was, and they had a different kind of system. They had this sticky paper and that collected, settled dust. It trapped fallout and they were able to measure it. After months of preparation, Marston was ready for the most secret and politically sensitive project in the history of CSIRO. But then Britain changed its plans. 
With Cold War tensions increasing, it would now urgently explode two atomic devices on the Montebello Islands off West Australia, the site of its first test four years earlier. Two explosions at the Montebello Islands uh, during 56 were used by Headley to check his procedure, to check the equipment, and to check that he was ready for the Maralinga show, as he liked to call it. I carefully had people send in a, a sample thyroid test just to make sure everything was going, and the thyroid arrived in suitable condition and so on. And lo and bloody behold, Monty Bello had come on. Letter to Dr. Fred White, Chief Executive Officer of CSIRO, secret. We have found conclusive proof that a band of airborne radioactivity has passed over northern Australia in the last 10 to 12 days. Uh, we should be able to trace its course from the findings of the routine examinations of thyroids that are being made here. Insofar as I can judge, there's no reason to become excited about the implied hazard. Yours, Headley. Weeks later, news came through that another atomic trial was imminent on the Montebello Islands. But Marston had suffered a heart attack. It could not have come at a worse time. An official press release claimed it was a small atomic device but at almost eight times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, this was Britain's largest atomic test so far. Instead of sending the radioactive fallout out to sea, it went right across the whole of the northern half of Australia. A few days later, a technician on the other side of the continent was calibrating a Geiger counter for the Australian Air Force. On this particular day, um, I had one unit which would not respond to its normal calibration. Uh, its background was substantially higher than a normal background count. And I walked around with a thing in my hand, thinking, what can it be, where have I gone wrong? And as I approached the window, the count started to increase. And I thought, it's strange, so I stepped back and it reduced. And then I got suspicious, so I started running the Geiger counter around the actual window frame. And I may add, it was raining cats and dogs in Brisbane at that particular time. I stuck it outside, and the count went off its rocker. And obviously, we're having radioactive rain. Within one hour, a car turned up with a couple of officers, and they removed the Geiger counters we had there that we had repaired, as well as the radioactive material. And the owner of the business uh, informed me there that I had to, uh, not to mention to anyone or even talk about it, because that he was now under the Official Secrets Act. And uh, I never discussed with anybody since. That day, radioactive rain fell throughout Queensland. As much as the government tried, it could not contain the story. For the government, it was an absolute disaster because we have this prospector near Cloncurry, bawling his billy as the story goes. And 